Oi oi, it's your boy. The Paul Phoenix of delivering peen kicks. Jack Slack, and it's the Jack Slack podcast. Coming at you on Monday the 12th of July. Following uh, UFC 264, 5, Poirier versus McGregor 2. No, 3, fuck. Let's do that again. Coming at you following uh, Poirier versus McGregor 3. Um, and there might be a 4 now. <laughs> so, you know... Um, yeah, well, let's just dive right into it. We'll start with the uh, main event. I thought um, it was a, it was a good fight while it lasted. Uh, we, I mean, we'll do all the like, what's left for McGregor? Pontificating, navel gazing, butthole gazing in a minute. Um, but as a fight, I thought it was pretty good. Um, well, it was always going to be good. These two, like as short lived as their fights have been, they've been violent and fun. And uh, this was no exception to that. In fact, their second fight is now the longest, and that was still quite a short fight. But it was very interesting, and there was some stuff going on. And, like, if you're a, you know, oh, Conor McGregor's done sort of guy, put that off. We'll talk about that in a minute. We're going to talk about some technical stuff. And there was some stuff that he did that I liked. Um, Coming out, low kicking was, you know, a a good idea until it wasn't. (laughs) But, um... Using the kicks more from the very opening, you saw him go to the uh, the back kick to the body multiple times, which I very much liked because uh, you know you you've got a uh, a closed stance matchup between McGregor and Poirier, and that was what was what has been giving um, McGregor so much trouble. It's what gave him so much trouble with Diaz. All his weapons, like the left straight, is his main weapon. Uh, it's all geared towards not having that lead shoulder there, and not only is Poirier. Um, naturally set up to deal with like lead left hands better he's also like he does the shoulder roll a lot and conor mcgregor's the perfect opponent to be doing uh to be shoulder rolling off the left hands against uh and he did in this fight uh, shoulder roll a couple off which was lovely but the cool thing about the back kick or turning kicks generally um which i didn't even think about in the previous uh you know the previous two things i did on this um was that it it naturally it's it's a wep- it's a weapon he already uses and it naturally slots into fighting against uh, a, a fellow southpaw so many so many of his weapons are not suited to that southpaw versus southpaw matchup you know he he has to work on like using his jab using the the outside low kick stuff that he doesn't use in most of his fights but the back kick or, or rather spinning kicks generally is something that he's already been doing because that's his like uh, cage cutting weapon he has the left hand which everyone's running from and the wheel kick and the back kick come around from the opposite side to punish people for circling away and that works on um, orthodox opponents because they square up to circle the fence like their feet come level uh, is what i'm talking about but it works on southpaw opponents too because that is where you're going like the the back kick comes in through the open side or, you know, straight up the middle into the open side. Uh, it's why Raymond Daniels has had so much success with it. It's why Kung Lee used to step through, because he'd fight Southpaw, and he'd step through and switch to Orthodox to throw the back kick against most opponents who were Orthodox. But I thought that was a, an interesting shout, you know, because that's not... We were talking about last time getting to Poria's body, because no one is able to, or no one does. <laughs> like, people get fixated on punching him in the head, and he's very good at uh, giving you rubbish connections but we were saying like you know trying to use the right hook to Poirier's body um uh, trying to use like the lead leg front kick you know weapons that he doesn't really have but they managed to repurpose a weapon that he does which I really liked um then he was using the low kicks a lot and the low kick I mean I I took the chance in the filthy casuals guide which is doing amazing by the way it's got like 200,000 views so (laughs) and then I checked and it's like 1.2% 1.2% is from external links like Reddit and things like that. So really, when people do cry about the YouTube algorithm, it, I mean, it really does matter. <laughs> like, you know, I had no control over this doing well. It was just YouTube recommended it to a load of people. Um, but don't stop plugging it if you are. Uh, but the uh, in the Filthy Casuals Guide, I took the chance to like, well, I figured there'd be a lot of people seeing it who hadn't seen my previous work. And I thought... What a great chance to talk about the low kicking, you know, meta game or whatever you want to call it. Why low kicking is the way it is at the moment. So about a third of the video is about that. 
and talking about like where you want to kick, where why you want to why you want to kick there, how you know how uh, it's it's lessening the chance of you hurting yourself on a check. And I specifically say the words though it is very rare to snap your shin in half. Shin injuries are you know injuring yourself on a kick is still fairly common. Um, but no, the dude snapped his fucking shin in half, which is just unbelievable. It keeps happening to like big name fighters. It's not like undercard guys like Corey Hill it's it's Anderson Silva Chris Weidman Conor McGregor it's just bonkers but um one of the really interesting things about this and I'm sure you've gone back to but I mean it's a short fight so it's not hard but you, you know I, I went back to try I went back to try and find where he um hit something solid could have been like the sh- the bo- uh, top of the shin just below the knee could have been the elbow those are the things that tend to break legs um, or cause fractures in kicks. Uh, but I was having a hard time with this uh, because basically everyone in the aftermath was like, Conor McGregor saw how effective the calf kick was and started calf kicking, and he didn't. He was he was kicking above the knee. If you go back and watch the connections, I paused on, I think, most of them I was able to catch, and they're all above the knee. But they're literally just above the knee, like the most sort of dangerous place, because if he, if he lifts his leg up a little bit, you're going to be kicking the hardest part of the leg. But that being said, I couldn't find like a um, dead to rights. You've kicked the front of the shin or the the top of the shin. You know, you've kicked a hard part moment. I think he was just kicking right by the knee and it was a a fairly hard part of the leg and he fucked his leg up. And part of that could be um, lack of uh, experience. This is the the thing, like... (laughs) Everyone in there, but like there was a dude commenting like Conor McGregor needs to start training like the ties, throwing five thousand kicks a day, um, running X miles, blah blah blah. And he just listed out like what a, a person would do in a Muay Thai camp, and you're like, dope. What's he gonna do about the grappling part? <laughs> there is a a limit on what you can do in becoming like a world class knack Muay while also competing in MMA. Um, but when you're there's there's a couple of things about it like Muay Thai. Yes, they do a ton of bag work and they do a ton of pad work. But pads are fairly new in the grand scheme of things. Like Muay Thai is a very old tradition and the the Thai pads are fairly new. A lot of what old Thai gyms used to do and what what many top Thai gyms still do is just like play spa with a lot of control. And they're not punting each other in the legs. Like um, in Holland... They do go for the legs hard every session and they just condition themselves to taking kicks and giving kicks. But a lot of uh, the old Thai gyms didn't do that. What you will notice generally in good high level Muay Thai is that guys are very, while they do kick hard, they tend to be very um, cautious with their shot selection. There's an awful lot of misdirection. There's a lot of changing up the kicks. Um, They'll throw kicks that aren't like designed to break people's legs. If you're going to kick a lot, I mean, it really is worth your... It's like if you want to box well, it's worth your while learning to, you know, apply dynamics to your striking. You, um, oh, hey, plug for dynamicstriking.com. But, um, you know, not everything has to be forte. You can you can tone it down a little bit. You can throw lesser shots. That was what was crazy about Nick Diaz's career. People were amazed. Like, they were going, he's throwing half-power shots, but then Marius Zeromskis, um lunges back at him gets hit by a check hook that looks like 50 percent power but gets knocked out you know a punch is still a punch if you're throwing it with some weight behind it uh you don't have to throw everything at 100 percent. and the same more so of a kick because a kick is fucking heavy your leg is heavy watch some of those old remy boyanski head kicks where he kicks with the lead lead leg and the foot just sort of slaps the face but because he's a six foot five guy and his leg is x amount of his body and it weighs a quarter of his body weight when it slaps people in the face it, it has some weight behind it but then you get into like the idea of conditioning and conditioning is a really strange subject anyway um you know before i've been doing a lot of work on traditional martial arts lately um but it's, it's really interesting because the whole iron body sort of training thing uh came about when the, you know people didn't spar a lot there wasn't a lot of like I mean, no one saw anyone else fight either. So if you were going to fight someone, you you had no idea what techniques they had access to. Um, So guys were focused on like making themselves impenetrable to damage. And there's all sorts of like feats that guys perform to demonstrate their like iron bodies. Um, But shin conditioning is one of the things that's sort of left over from that obsession with uh, iron body training. 
And there's always this debate between are you deadening the nerves or are you strengthening the bones? Um, are bones strengthened with micro fractures that then grow back? You know, the bone grows back stronger. I think that's called wolf wolf syndrome or something like that. Uh, or are you creating micro fractures that then you've basically like perforated a piece of paper? It's ready to tear at that place later. Um, and I've seen a lot of different things on it by people being like, "Oh, the science of this." Um, so it's still sort of a, a strange up in the air area uh, area of combat sports. But I think that the interesting thing is, like, if you thought I was going to be like, whoa, freak injury, don't count that win. <laughs> but if you kick a check and you break your leg, you kicked the check, you're out of the fight. Like, that's that's a TKO, you know, injury stoppage, whatever you want to call it, but you're lost. That's not a no contest. Because blocking is legit. Like, I can't recommend highly enough um, Skarbowski's series on Fanatics. Um, I, one of my favourite things on there. Um, he talks a lot it's like it's three different series he's got a beginner um, intermediate and advanced but in all of them he talks about how important checking kicks is because it the kicks are scored so highly in thailand and he was more of a puncher and he was like so i needed to get people to stop kicking so he talks all about like uh using both forearms and a knee or a shin to check kicks he talks about um when he fought borkow who you know obviously an amazing kicker and Skarbowski took him at short notice and was underweight. You know, he, t- he turned up pudgy and still was lighter than Boakow. But uh, one of the things he was very proud of was that he managed to get Boakow to stop kicking as much. Uh, because if you put elbows and knees, well, not specifically the point of your elbow and knee, but like top of the shin, just under the knee, and uh, bottom of the forearm, just above the elbow. If you can put those in the path of a kick, people people will kick you as hard as they can. And they might, they'll probably come off worse. And when I say forearm, you know, probably both arms on a kick. Um, that was something Kung Lee used to go on about because he broke Frank Shamrock's arm. He was like, well, his first mistake was trying to block kicks with one arm. But yes, the strange thing was that I didn't spot any particularly um, like dead to rights checks. I think he just kept kicking near the knee and uh, hurt himself doing it. If you watch a lot of the guys uh, in kickboxing, you know, we talked so much about the calf kick and how it protects you a good degree from the opponent picking their leg up and putting the hardest portion of their shin in the way. Um, what a lot of very good Dutch low kickers did, like Rob, Rob Kamen, is that they'd get close to kick, as in they they combination punch, and, they, and the right low kick would often come off the left hook, so you're, you're really quite close when you throw the low kick. It's not that sort of um, long-range artillery that everyone's using the low kicks for in MMA. Um, but like Kamen and people like that, they would pick the the leg up to kick and turn it over, and it would come down on top of the uh, of the thigh, so that it was almost impossible to come up into the knee. Even if the person picked their leg up, they would try and slam on the top of the quad. And I, I plugged it before, but um, Sifu McInnes is it McInnes? Yeah, Sifu McInnes, uh, who did uh, or Sylvie. Um, Douglas Von Etu or Von Douglas Etu? Sylvie, she uh, has a video with him on her Patreon and he's a really interesting guy because he was around a lot of the golden era greats and uh, he talks a lot about like how the Dutch used to throw their low kick up and over. But as we said with uh, Ernesto Hoost, I mentioned him last week, but if you watch an Ernesto Hoost seminar, when you watch his fights, it's like he he's kicking the leg every 10 seconds. But in his seminars, he's like... Do not kick the leg if you think they're going to pick their leg up. I do so much work to make sure that their leg is on the floor. Because kicking like willy-nilly is just asking to get hurt in kickboxing. Uh, And I think we're getting to the point in MMA where, uh, I can't remember who it was, I was listening to the Heavy Hands boys, but they were saying like, you're probably going to start seeing more leg breaks uh, coming up because people have been getting off scot-free with the calf kick. Uh, And and I think the interesting point about this one is that Conor McGregor wasn't even throwing the calf kick, he was throwing above the knee. Um... But people have just got this confidence throwing naked low kicks now. I think it probably helps that Conor McGregor's last Southpaw opponent uh, and last rematch that he came back and won was uh, Nate Diaz, who can't check a kick for love nor money. And it's probably a little bit telling that that fight put Conor McGregor on crutches and he was there behind the scenes after the fight being like, they say he's got a weakness to low kicks, but I'll tell you what, he checked a load of mine. And you're watching the fight going, I don't think he did, Conor. I think you kicked him like pretty much every time. This is going to be a thing now, glass ankles. And actually, we're going to be talking about Sean O'Malley later. But um, uh, in terms of the stand-up, uh, aside from that, I thought um, Poirier looked sharp on, with his hands, as always. 
Uh, and he looked even less concerned. You know, we talked about like once you've been in there once, it's a lot less scary. But I think if there's an if there's a seven, eight year gap between the first and the second one, you probably don't benefit from that as much. But in the second fight, once he got McGregor's timing down, he was rolling off left hands, either with the shoulder roll or just getting hit with the left hand and turning his head. Um, you know, just being able to look at McGregor and say, OK, well, I can see when he's punching. I've got my reactions. And that's something that P- Poirier has been able to, de- uh, to develop by learning to box. He now has an eye for when these things are coming. And that's not to say you always will. You know, that's one of the reasons that fighters, when they slow down and their reactions slow down, they, they get hurt more because you can't see the punches coming as quickly. But he was looking razor sharp in this one. He rolled off a couple of left hands, uh, caught him with a good left hand. And, and that, that was when I knew that McGregor was kicking um, or, or noticed that McGregor was kicking above the, fu- uh, above the knee for the first time because Poirier was able to step in on him when he threw the kick and it rode up his leg, which we talked about. Because you remember from the first fight when Poirier was kicking him below the knee... McGregor was stepping in, trying to punish him, but the whole leg was in between him and uh, Poirier. It didn't ride up his his thigh, which is what happens with traditional low kicking. There's a takedown by Poirier, uh, which was turned into a, a Poirier-esque gu- guillotine attempt by McGregor. Um, I believe Poirier has still never won a fight by guillotine. Am I correct? But he goes for it. Like, it's his worst move. <laughs> Someone pointed out, Conor McGregor stole Dustin Poirier's worst, worst move. Um, but he went for a guillotine. And it was a low elbow guillotine. He was doing the S grip, the um, Luta Livre way, which is, you know, a legit submission if you're good at it, like Leo Zinho or um, uh, Pequeno. But uh, one of the things that has made it fall from favor with a lot of jiu-jitsu players is that the Marcelo team with the high elbow over the shoulder, that can give you some protection. Even if you don't have a guard, you can start working back into a guard because you've got something above his collarbone. Whereas McGregor just grabbed his neck and sat down and then, you know, uh, Poirier was like, oh, I'm out. Of your guard, at least. Um, ended up back in closed guard, dropped some nice elbows from there. McGregor played a little bit of Dan Ige cross sleeve gu- uh, cross sleeve guard, putting his fingers inside the glove. <laughs> I mean, you know McGregor loves cheating like that. Um, it's one of the interesting things about that Habib matchup. Like, people edited the footage because there was round three where he got his ass absolutely battered from the closed guard. And round four, I think it was, or round two and round three, I forget. But there was the round where he got his ass actually absolutely handed to him. And then he had a better round because he was holding the glove the entire time. And he ended the round on the feet, holding Habib's glove with like both sets of fingers in. Uh, And Habib loses it and he's shouting at Herb Dean, who was useless last night to or Saturday night or whatever it was. But he was was especially useless in that Habib um, McGregor fight. But Habib's shouting and shouting, and that's when McGregor goes, it's only business. But people edited it in to be like after him getting his ass kicked from closed guard. Like, he got his ass kicked either way, and he cheated either way. Do you have to, like, you know, make it look like that? No, he, I mean, the only reason Habib was angry was because he managed to hold him off by flagrantly cheating for, like, half a round. Um, but he did it again here, and Dustin Poirier was angry about it, and, uh, I mean... If there's a time I'm talking to the referee or looking at the referee, it's probably not when I'm standing over the guy and he's trying to upkick me. <laughs> like just like, well, you might just have to put up with him trying to cheat there uh, and bring it to Herb's attention later. Um, but good ground and pound from Dustin. It reminded me of the Joe Duffy performance where he got back into the fight just by closed guard ground and pound, which not a lot of guys are good at. And Dustin is actually pretty good at it. But McGregor gets back to his feet, immediately throws a low kick. I checked. It seemed to land above the knee. Didn't look like it was checked. Uh, and then he throws a front kick and then a one-two and then his leg folds in half. <laughs> you go, what the fuck happened? Um, so then, you know, it was pandemonium. Uh, the, you know, uh, Poirier swarmed in for the stoppage. Obviously, McGregor not going to be able to fight his way back to his feet if his leg's in half. And most people, I mean, I didn't realise, but most people didn't realise that his leg was in half but until the doctor came in and he's like screaming. Um the, the whole thing, I mean, we'll, we've done the technique stuff. That was interesting. Oh, the other thing about the technique stuff, actually, uh, I was quite interested by McGregor. We talked about the right front kick. Sorry, the left front kick. That's his favorite, the left uh, front snap kick. And we were saying like that or the teep, you know, just pushing with it um, against the calf kick. Uh, pretty good idea. Whereas rear leg front kicks a little bit harder to line up. Uh, it from a closed guard stance just as a lead. So he said maybe the, the front leg front kick. I was quite interested by him going uh, orthodox and uh, using like push kicks off the lead leg. That was quite interesting. When he threw a kick, he'd go back to orthodox and then try and pick up the lead leg. Um, so he was, he was playing with new ideas. But um, yeah, no, that's all the technique shit out of the way. Uh, Dustin was still better. 
Uh, it was really interesting. I mean, I would love to watch it go longer, but it didn't. And, uh, you know, you could complain about that. But it, to be honest, Dustin might just take the money and have the fight again rather than fight Oliveira. Because, I mean, yes, he's got a good chance of winning the title against Oliveira, but he's got a better chance of making a long and happy life where he never needs to earn any more money by fighting McGregor again. But the aftermath of this fight was very weird, um, very uncomfortable. You know, it, McGregor's kind of like one of those Tank Abbott guys where if you knock him out, he'll stand up and go, oh, okay, you knocked me out. But if he doesn't lose a way that he feels is a correct loss, he'll be really a sore loser about it. Uh, and it was very ugly, this whole thing. Like, um, To be honest, it was especially ugly because, um, one, he, like, before... It, like it settles in that he's okay but his leg's broken he's trying to put his foot back together and then the doctor's trying to touch his leg and he's like don't touch my leg don't touch my leg because you've seen Weidman you've seen Silver you've seen these guys who snap their shin in half I mean imagine looking down at your leg and it being in two pieces <laughs> you know, like it's you, you're probably worried you're never going to walk again even though like Chris Weidman has rebounded in incredible time um, it is a, a ghoulish in injury which uh, you know would scare the shit out of you but then he's screaming at like bruce buffer make sure they say uh doctor's stoppage or whatever and it was just uh, and then obviously all the stuff in the interview afterwards it was so graceless and you can do the whole like oh selling a rematch or whatever thing but like at that point just no it's not doing anything i think the worst part was that um rogan sat down next to him and interviewed him it seems like espn have been like bring back interviewing knocked out fighters or, or people off devastating stoppages but yeah, just like the whole shouting about Dustin's wife, even after losing again and being stretched out. Um, really gross. So happy for Poirier. Uh, I'm, if they do Oliveira versus Poirier, I'm very excited. If they do Poirier versus Gaethje. I mean, it would be a little bit unfair to do like a, another step before the title fight here. Um, but if they did Poirier versus Gaethje too, I'd be really down for that as well. But if he wants to fight McGregor again, you know, like... Even if you're like, oh, Conor McGregor's done. Um, I mean, these these two have fun fucking fights. And at least you're then cashing in on the animosity between them, you know? Uh, what better way to get back at someone than in the last two fights, you must feel you've comfortably got the measure of him. If you compare the last two fights to the, to the first fight, I mean, there were moments that McGregor was doing well. I'm not going to say, like, Dustin absolutely dominated him. But Dustin was comfortable and in control and, like, never the first fight he looks so skittish and uncomfortable and doesn't really know what he's doing like these fights he just looked like a guy who's been fighting constantly for the last you know 10 years or whatever it is and we are obviously mcgregor has not and i think there, were, there was something really interesting it was i think it was when i was watching him getting ground and pounded from closed guard by dustin i thought of the joe duffy fight and i realized that there is an interesting comparison between mcgregor and duffy because joe duffy disappeared to boxing for like four years and lost a good deal of his career, came back, he was good enough to get into the UFC, but there's still that sort of like, what if he hadn't? What if he kept going? You know, what if he kept st stayed in MMA the entire time? And to be fair to Duffy, you know, he was improving his boxing the entire time that he was out. Uh, he was actually pursuing a boxing career, whereas Conor McGregor was doing a cash grab fight. And even when he was like training for Floyd, he was just bringing in like no hopers to make him feel good. Um, and we'll talk about like gym changing and stuff in a second, but it's very interesting because, you know, you watch the McGregor, um, the first McGregor Poirier fight, the the way McGregor's moving, it's just, yeah, you know, he was a force of nature back then. And he watches his recent few and it looks like he believes he's a force of nature until he loses. You know, like it's just, it, he's not as sharp. And that's totally understandable because he's in there with guys who have been fighting the best of the best until they met him whereas he's been sitting by the pool you know, and, and then coming back and be like i'm ready to fight the best of the best the guy desperately needs a step back in competition i mean like he fought cowboy and that was definitely a step back in competition but it was a step back in competition with the aim of justifying him be, being like number two ranked lightweight in the world after five years of not winning at lightweight but this is where we get into like the is mcgregor over and stuff like that and it, no he's not i mean he's got a great contract with the ufc it's not it's still not what it should be for what he brings in for them. But uh, even if he weren't a draw anymore, he's got like a guaranteed five, six million per fight or whatever it is. If he wanted to fight lesser opponents, he would still be drawing for them. And honestly, that's what he should be doing. He should be getting back on his feet. He should be building up the experience if he wants to do it. But 
even with his great contract, I don't know if that's interest enough for him to be back into this, you know? Um, say what... I mean, we are a very pro-getting-fighters-paid-more show here, and uh, Cub Swanson's wife put out a statement being like, we need to get together the wives of MMA fighters, and I was like, unionize MMA fighters' wives, that's the secret. But Dustin Poirier is probably not paid enough that he could just disappear for five years, comfortably. Habib managed to get to the point where he was, and that was obviously helped by a lot of endorsements and things at home. But, I mean, it comes back to that sort of hunger thing, you know? I, the the cliche line about, like, it's hard to get up for the silk sheets when you're doing morning runs. Um, but, you know, if it's an option for you to sit out for five years or, you know, however many years, or... I, I think if it's an option for you to take long breaks and come back and be like, yes, I'll fight the best of the best, please, I think that's really bad. Um... That's how you delude yourself because Conor McGregor at his peak, you know, um, Jose Aldo fight, Eddie Alvarez, you know, that night. F- yeah, favorable matchup stylistically, but, you know, that's how fights work. One person's going to end up with a favorable matchup in the matchup. Um, but yes, fighting regularly on form. However, it's the lightweight division. It's, n- it's not even the featherweight division anymore. He's got, you know, he's done very little at lightweight that's legit. And... The arrogance to believe that, like, you can half ass it in this division and then just come back and fight the best is, uh, yeah, I mean, that'll get you hurt very quickly. It's like if Habib's off for any good length of time and then comes back, I would be very uh, sceptical of him, you know, of the comeback. Because you're not just talking about being out, you're also talking about, like, not training with that same intensity. Um, even if he's training with Islam and, and making him work, you know, I, I doubt he's training with that same, like, I have to finish this fight right now against Justin Gaethje because I have the mumps and a broken foot intensity. Actually, while I was thinking about this, I was thinking about another interesting comparison between Charles Oliveira and um, Robert Whittaker. Because basically, if Charles Oliveira, um, you you know, if if Dustin Poirier decides he wants a fourth fight against Conor McGregor and to cash in, you've got, um, you know, a lot of people believe Poirier is the best in the world right now. Uh, MMA fighting just did its own rankings, which is really interesting because I've been saying there should be independent rankings for years. Um, I was saying the MMA Journos Association should sign off on a set of rankings. But MMA fighting actually did it. They're quite interesting. You know, there's some there's some shortcomings. They've ranked Gegard Mousasi uh, in the top 10 middleweights in the world. Bit of a bit of a mistake. He's on the regional scene. Uh, and they put, like, Pitbull Frere as number three featherweight in the world. And you're like, he's beaten no one on the level of the other top 15. Um, but it's nice that there are independent rankings that include all associate, all, all um, promotions. But in those rankings, a lot of people uh, had... Well, I think Dustin Poirier came out above Charles Oliveira. Which some people like lost their shit about. They were like, he's not got the belt. And you're like, that's the point. Rankings aren't about the belt. Rankings are about who is the best in the world. And you know, Dustin Poirier has a very good case for that. Problem is, Charles Oliveira has the belt now. He's done everything that has been asked of him. He's waiting for a fight against the next best guy in the world. And he might end up in a Robert Whittaker situation where he's got the belt, but they're busy doing other shit with Poirier and McGregor. You know, I mean, they won't make another belt like it. Robert Whittaker got an interim belt because he was the best in the world at the time, but Bisping was fighting Dan Henderson and then GSP wanted to come back. And it was just like there was a belt and then a real belt, but the real belt was the interim belt and the other belt was the real belt. It was it was very stupid. And you might get something similar going on here with um, Charles Oliveira if Poirier doesn't just opt to fight him. Anyway, buy the hot sauce. Um... <laughs> Use regular floor polish, don't buy uh, proper 12, and um, we'll talk about the rest of the fights now. Gilbert Burns vs. Uh, Stephen Thompson was a very weird fight. Uh, it was a fight where Stephen Thompson didn't evolve, you know, this man has been like, you can't get his back to the fence for love nor money, and then he just ended up leaning on the fence for the entire first round and for large portions of the other rounds. Um, Gilbert Burns dropped himself with a punch (laughs) which is just incredible it's on Twitter go find it Um, Thompson dings him with a counter punch Burns like throws an uppercut hits his own face like Tyson Fury style and I think he was planning to level change but it's so poorly coordinated that he uppercuts himself in the face and falls on his hands (laughs) but um, yeah uh, it was weird because Thompson was landing good shots on the feet Burns wasn't landing great shots on the feet, but he was getting to the fence and then pursuing a takedown for whole rounds at a time. Got top position, didn't do anything. 
Uh, last 15 seconds of the fight, he just unloads with hammer fists to the back of the neck. And Mark Goddard stood there watching him and just ignoring it. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, Goddard would be like, there was an angle on them, which is everyone's solution. Like, if you flagrantly elbow someone in the back of the head and the ref doesn't call it, someone will chime in. Like, like all refs are on the same wavelength and see everything. But he opted not to do anything about it because there was an angle on it. It's actually a uh, one to seven elbow. But yes, this is a bad fight, and honestly, it made me feel bad about the welterweight division, because while there are a lot of good fighters in the top end of the welterweight division now, um, we got to a point where, like, there's just these dudes hanging around waiting for a title shot, and the other guys can't break through. So you've got Burns now, with that boring win over Stephen Thompson, ready to go and get his ass kicked again. You've got Colby Covington sitting on a win over Tyron Woodley, which is incredible, because, like, he was desperately trying for attention this week, and nobody gave a shit. He was like, Dustin Poirier hasn't beaten anyone relevant in X years. And you're like, you're sitting on a win over Tyron Woodley. But you know that. He just wants people to say that and talk about him. Um, and people weren't, which was great. But yes, uh, Usman being a dominant champion and then the weird setup of the rest of the division and Leon Edwards' bad luck uh, have really just um, made the top end of that division quite boring. Not boring, just um, there's not anything on the horizon that you're like, oh, nice. Tai Tuivasa versus Greg Hardy. I didn't even preview this because I was like, it's going to be some fat bums swing, swing at each other. Now, Tai Tuivasa is a bum, but he's our bum. And he got it done. Um, yeah, Greg Hardy dinged in with the right hand. He did the stanky leg, stumbled back. And then as Greg, Greg Hardy came in to follow up, he hit him with a, he missed the right hand and hit him with a left hook in the eye and put him on the mat. Um, it was lovely. But then he did like eight shoeys because it is definitely sexual. Uh, he just likes being, he likes people spitting and, and sweating in his drink basically um i mean good for him you know he's got a gimmick he's living the gimmick he's basically draws from uh the wwf he asked for a top 10 fighter and you're like mm, i've seen you against top 10 fighters it wasn't great i mean like if you if you want to watch what heavyweight mma would be like if it was women's mma go watch spivak versus tuivasa because spivak's just like hey stop it grabs the headlock takes him down sits in scarf hold or just like side headlock and tai tuivasa can't get up <laughs> it's so funny i mean they put him against um, the ghost of jds hoping to get him like an easy knockout and he managed to lose that by knockout so um you know i was excited for tuivasa at one point but i just don't think he's anything special I mean, really, the two of Asa situation is the same as Greg Hardy. It's like, if heavyweights were any good, this wouldn't be a problem. But there will always be numerous heavyweights in the UFC who will lose to Greg Hardy. But Aldana versus Kuniskaya, well done to Aldana for getting a stoppage, which ruined my parlay on the two women's fights going to the decision. Um, Yana Kuniskaya, uh, the loss to Aspen Ladd taught her to key eye on everything, even if you miss. Um, but she got knocked down with a left hook and then just got pounded out, basically. Got stuck on her side in the same sort of way. I mean, obviously not the same sort of way, but like the she got stuck on her own arm in the way that uh, Ryan Hall seemed to later on. Or earlier on. He was earlier in the night, sorry. Um, Sean O'Malley versus Chris Moutinho. I thought, firstly, I didn't listen to this commentary, which I'm glad. But Chris Moutinho gave a good account of himself because he, I mean, throughout this entire fight, you could see that he was a basic sort of fighter. That he is not at the point where... He's going to make uh, waves through the through the UFC, I don't think. Um, you know, their, their highlight reel package of him had him ducking under a, a, a right hand from a gassed opponent and, like, clenching them, and then they fell to the mat on their own, and he, like, followed them. Uh, and that was their highlight of him, you know, where they had Sean O'Malley knocking out a load of dudes. But he, did, he gave a good account of himself in this one. He just pursued Matt O'Malley the entire time, got lit up, but... Firstly, it was interesting because he was going on to O'Malley the entire time, which can obviously amplify someone's shots. But it looked like O'Malley did not like being crowded and couldn't pick his shots as cleanly. Um, and also, whenever Moutinho like, kicked his legs, O'Malley would stumble around and change up his whole stance to deal with it for like the next two exchanges and then go back to moving again. You can really hamper O'Malley's A game by low kicking. Because anyone who uses a lot of footwork, if... They have to like pick a leg up to check a kick. They're not in the same position that they would be if they're just freely bounding around the ring. Just throwing the kicks in the first place will make people change what they're doing, and that that's really obvious with Sean O'Malley. Actually, on the subject of O'Malley, I forgot to mention in the main event, 
both guys, uh, Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier, were changing stances. And that, I mean, the moment that I saw them both doing that, I was like, they, this fight is about to be a car crash. Because we talked about this with O'Malley versus Vera in our preview. I was like, if O'Malley switches, just switch with him. Because Vera can um, switch hit quite comfortably. And if you can do that with someone who's a very technical switch hitter, what what O'Malley does is you come at him in your orthodox stance and he knows when he's southpaw, he's throwing uh, left high kicks, left body kicks, left straights. When he's orthodox, he's jabbing, he's throwing right low kicks. You know, there, there are different options depending on which way your body is facing. And if your body's the constant and his is changing, he's got two sets of options. Uh, whereas if you're changing and he's changing, he's got to stop and work out what's going on. So it really made the Vera fight ugly for him. Um, but like the main event too, like it's just chaos. Um, but this one, you know, O'Malley's front kicks were great. We did a thing about him uh, on the Patreon. I wrote a thing about him for the Patreon boys after the Oma- uh, the Almeida fight uh, on cross-stepping because he likes to throw his front kick from his rear leg and then put it down just in front of his, you know, his standing leg and push back. Uh, so he sort of cross-steps himself and he caught Almeida with a counter off that, but he does that a lot does the pep step a lot which is where you circle you flatten out your stance and circle one way and then as the opponent turns to face you you just bound back the other way with a a right straight or a left straight off the the furthest hand it was a really nice one where because if you go when he went to the fence he uh did the thing where you put your back on the fence and you stand on one foot and you teep and he did that and then he bounded out and came back again with the right hand it was all really nice but Moutinho was there the entire time um, and it was kind of weird because Herb Dean let him take 14 and a half minutes of damage and just decided in, in the last 30 seconds to, uh, to stop it. Uh, but then Herb Dean's been horribly inconsistent for ages now. I said after the fight, the best thing Bellator could do for MMA is offer Herb Dean a commentary gig. <laughs> just get him out of the ring. What else was good? Max Griffin got by Carlos Condit. Well done to him. Um... Michelle Pereira versus Nico Price was a weird fight. It was always going to be a weird fight. Uh, the things that stood out for me, with these two, you got just about one of every foul because both of them love fouling the shit out of people. Um, you got fingers in the eyes. You got some groin kicks. Nico Price, anytime he went to his back and Michelle Pereira was stood in front of his guard, he kicked him in the cup. It was very weird. Like he tried to clap it between his feet one time and then he axe, axe kicked him in the cup another uh, another time. But then Michel Pereira, he had a storming round where he came out and mounted Nico Price really early on. And that's because he got him down and he did the backflip guard pass, which has never, ever worked. But this time he did it and then he turned around and mounted Nico Price. And I was like, why did that work? And I went back and watched it several times. And it's because he, he kicked him in the head as he was coming down. And Nico Price grabbed his head and was like, dude, he kicked me in the head. Uh, and while he was doing it, Michel Pereira just mounted him. Who was the ref on this? Oh, Mark Smith. Yeah, did not do a great job, I thought. Um, yeah, it was an okay fight. You know, you got a good amount of craziness from Michelle Pereira. You got a good amount of um, fighting decently enough. Uh, and yeah, you know, there were some nice Superman punches off the fence and stuff. I thought Nico Price looked quite well prepared for things like that. Like the moment that he saw Michelle Pereira back in towards the fence, he was ready for it, ducked under it, clinched up. Um, but yeah, I thought Michelle Pereira looked good. Oh, fun stuff now. Nerd's Choice, uh, Ryan Hall versus Ilya Tapuria. This was, oh, I mean, it's always going to be interesting. It's a Ryan Hall fight. But we talked about it in the pre-fight. Uh, I said Ilya Tapuria, Tapuria seems like a really horrible matchup in terms of, like, you're not going to get much from beating him, but he's also, like, a guy who has better skills to be beating Ryan Hall than a lot of the people that, um, you know, I'd have given him a better chance of beating Ryan Hall than Ricardo Lamas. You know, he's just, he's got a really awkward skill set. Very strong wrestler, good grappler, works well off the front headlock. But also pressures well, hits the body almost exclusively for the early going. Um, stuff that I really liked. Uh, and against Ryan Hall, he didn't even get off body punches or anything that much. He just managed to apply pressure on Ryan while also being ready to bail the fuck out whenever Ryan came at him. Um, it was quite interesting what Ryan was do- doing. You didn't see any of his traditional Imanari roles. Uh, you know, head to the outside of the lead leg, uh, like underhand grip and spin round it. Um, he, and he also does it like off a high crotch sort of shot too. But he was doing, he was sort of leaning forward and reaching around the guy's leg like he was doing uh, well, the reverse single leg position is what I've heard it called when Askren does it from um, a funk roll. But... Uh, yeah, it was like he's trying to overwrap the leg and like roll through. 
And I think he was trying to do a sort of Granby and open up to Puri's top elbow. Uh, I couldn't quite work out how he was, like, if he was going to be able to get into the legs from it. It didn't look like it was working that well. Uh, there was a couple of moments where he, like, got to turtle with Tapuria on top of him and then started um, doing what he calls the hip hop, no, hippoplatamus. I can't remember what it is, but it's where you open up the elbow with your back while you're rolling through, kind of like an omoplata. Um, and he almost got that a couple of times. But Tapuria did a great job of just staying out of that um, and crowding him. And with Ryan Hall, like, not a super explosive fighter on the feet, but he uses those long kicks very well to keep people off him, to accrue some damage, to land the odd head kick and so on. Um, Tapuria managed to crowd him enough that he was throwing punches and uh, getting caught on the return. Like, he tried to dart out the side door a couple of times and he got clipped on the way out. And then Hall was so comfortable throwing himself to the bottom that he kept, like, throwing himself to the bottom of the side and then coming up on the sort of Marcelo sit-up. Uh, and I, he came up and I think he was sort of headlocking him and he was on one post and he ended up falling on the post as Tapuria hit him. So he was on top of his own arm uh, and got stuck there as Tapuria hit him several more times. So rough one for Ryan Hall because, um, you know, he's been it's been so long that he's been out now and it was it was exciting to have him back. Um, but a good win for Ilya Tapuria gets to move on. I mean, with these ones, it's kind of like the Leo, Leo Santos stuff. Um, you know, when you've got a, uh, a prospect who's uh, it's been a long time between their fights and they're just not getting them in often enough, it'll either spur them to um, fight more often and just go like ham and, and take like three fights in a year or whatever, or it'll just or they'll just like not do any more. Which it seems like that's what Leo Santos is doing. He's just sort of stopped fighting. But very excited to see uh, Tapuria's future. Didn't get into one of the habits that I've noticed that he has. Like I said, he comes out and he hits the body early, which I really like. And I was saying like straight punching against Ryan Hall's body. Good idea because at least it keeps him off you. And then you can start coming up with the left hook to the head and whatever. But he did that against um, Yusuf Zalal. And then the, the, the moment that he was like, I'm going to start punching the head now, he starts swinging wide and Zalal is able to get underhooks on him and take him down, even though Tapuri is the strong wrestler. And and definitely as fights go on, Tapuria gasses. Um, his gas tank it, it did not impress me against uh, Zalal. What else was good? Dr uh, Drickus Duplessis versus uh, Trevin Giles. Get in the boys' stable, Dr uh, Drickus Duplessis. You, uh, you weird, weird man. I mean, I always liked Duplessis because... It, it's really weird because he had this knockout win over Roberto Soldic. He did then, you know, Roberto Soldic avenged it. So they're, I think they're... One and one, him and uh, Solditch. Yes, uh, Solditch, very bad man. Can't remember if he's still... No, he's not as champion with um, KSW at the moment, but he's he's close to being it again. Um, I'd done a filthy casuals guide to Roberto Solditch. He's very interesting. He's kind of like a um, welterweight crow cop. But Duplessis knocked him out in the first round of their fight. Uh, and then I think he got knocked out in the first round of their rematch. But very tricky customer because he came into the UFC and I watched him against Marcus Perez. And Marcus Perez is not a very slick striker, but Duplessis looked like he was just didn't know what to do for most of the fight, and then he knocked him out. And this one, again, was that. So it, I keep forgetting that this is just what Duplessis does. He's weird. He doesn't look like he knows what he's doing. And then he'll just spark someone. But he did it in this one. Um, yeah, uh, the grappling in this one was really fun, actually. Both gave a great account of themselves. Uh, Trevin Giles was giving him trouble with the jab. Uh, he got him to the corner, like to the, to the fence, and Duplessis covered up and then came off it with a one two. But it was a one, and then Trevin Giles was too far away to catch with a two, except then he lunged like first day at kickboxing class to go after the right straight as well. And I mean, the right straight went like a foot and a half further than the jab on this one two. Uh, so Trevin Giles had no idea it was coming. Uh, got sparked by it. It was it was really cool. Um, yeah, Duplessis is so weird because they keep going on about like he's got a lot of kickboxing experience. He uh, fought Roberto Solditch twice, knocked him out once. You know, he's been in with some very scary strikers. But when Giles threw stuff, he looked like oh. And uh, when Duplessis threw his kicks or his jab, his head goes up in the air. like he's got head whip. He throws his chin up in the air. Um, very interesting character. I mean, it's kind of like, um, who do I always, uh, oh, Karma Worthy, you know, very weird striker, but that weirdness has let him catch out a lot of other very good strikers. And so far, it doesn't look like Duplessis has the Karma Worthy chin problem. Jessica Rye versus Jennifer Meyer, Brad Tavares versus Emery Akhmadov, and then the last one that I really enjoyed was um, the first one of the fight. 
Zumagalov versus uh, Jerome Rivera. Zumagalov, he got this power guillotine with the figure four locked and he just like lifted Rivera up off the floor. It looked like, I mean, it was bending his neck sideways. So it was also um, a grobbit, the old Wigan grobbit, uh, a catch wrestling neck crank. If you turn the head sideways in a front headlock uh, and you bend it against your body. So that was very cool. Bonuses for Tuivasa for the knockout, obviously. Um, Duplessis for the knockout, obviously. And then uh, O'Malley and Moutinho got fight of the night, which I suppose is good because I want I wanted Chris Moutinho to get a bonus off that. But um, yeah, I mean that made Chris Mat- that made the fight just made Sean O'Malley look bad, to be honest. I mean he did everything he could. He was teeing off on this lad. But when a fighter who just doesn't seem to have anything for you can have you stumbling with the low kicks and back to the fence the entire fight. Not a great look. Man, I've got almost an hour, so um, we'll call it a day for the moment. Uh, if you want to sign up to the Patreon, be a boy, support the podcast, you get access to things like Advanced Striking 2.0 Dust Emporia, my love letter to the, to the uh, hillbilly shoulder roll. Uh, I'm also working on uh, Advanced Striking 2.0 Shogun this week, Shogun Hua. Going to be talking about landing soccer kicks and stomps and things. And that Shogun shift, the old shifting left hook. And wearing booty shorts as a 205 pound man. Um, yes, yeah, sign up to the Patreon, become a boy, support the podcast. If you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. And if you want to send an email to the podcast to be answered on the next podcast, um, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack, appreciating your working shins, bless. <laughs>